pleasure to be here. Um, the talk I'm going to give is one that has to do with what is going on, but even more, it's going to be about how we work. Because the theme of what I'm going to talk about is that the data that is coming about, the sensors, the technology that's sitting there, is putting together this, uh, if you want to use uh, Matt's analogy of the dinner smorgasbord of data. But as we start to look into that data, the ability to know how to get various people to work together, how to make the insights, is taking us out of the type of approaches that academia and industry have done for a long time. And forces us into working on teams, working in ways that, that, that are a little different. Two slides to set the, the stage. Um, and these are both about complexity. Um, for the non-biologists in the, in the room, um, the last 10 years, as we use these you know, sort of awesome technologies to take on things that we used to think were straightforward, have completely exploded what we thought were simple processes. So where there were symptoms, there were all these strings of molecular components. And where there were singular syndromes, someone could say, you have diabetes or you have Alzheimer's. What we know now is that actually in any one of those diseases, there are hundreds plus of variations that actually not everyone has the same version of what it is that used to be thought of as diabetes or Alzheimer's. And similarly, um, if you think of the, this description of what makes us sick, the, this uh, interplay between what it is that's sitting there as the um, agent and, and the host, again, has this complexity that, that has sort of gone with zoom and, and, and filled in, in in a way that sort of has us, our heads spinning. At the same time, when we go in and we start looking at what we used to think of as pathways, where we go, oh, we know what's going on. This is on the surface. This is in the nucleus. Every single one of those quote unquote pathways ends up having a complexity that basically is sitting against the way we like to think. Our brains are hardwired for the narrative. We like this goes to this goes to that. So we've just wandered into a recognition that's not the way the world is really wired. And we have to come up with ways of coping with that complexity, of, of embracing that complexity. And so in order to do that, what we've been thinking about is how, what, would, what could you assemble that actually might allow you to make sense of that extraordinary complexity? So six things, again, that I think some of you are very aware of, some uh, maybe not. Um, the amounts of omics data that's just flooding out there, pretty straightforward. The concept of network modeling and approaches to diseases, borrowing from other fields and looking at the complexity um, is something that's helping us. The, 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 the fact that we can actually put the data that we want to look at in a place where anyone can get to and allow people who weren't generating it to, to, to solve it is matched by something that is really odd for biologists, which is the uncoupling of the person that actually was generating the data and the person who's actually going to analyze it. Uh, people do not annotate their data in a sense that actually it could be useful to others. Um, and then two other things, which is um, something I'll talk a little bit about later. The movements that are abreast where patients themselves are beginning to realize they're the expert on their disease and they know what's going on and how to connect with them as the expert. And then also this ability to have social media approaches to solve problems all sort of sit there as little pieces that could be brought to bear on that level of complexity. So about five years ago, a group of roughly 40 people in Seattle um, uh, formed together as a nonprofit foundation uh, as an incubator for what could we do that might help other people work together. It wasn't as much as we're going to solve problems. It's can we build things that other people might find helpful if they're going to try to live in that way. And as an incubator, the goal was to come up with things and then hope that people would, would turn those into, into real uh, solutions. How can we go beyond the sort of current guilds of experts? How can we get people who don't usually talk to each other to work together? And what we've been working on is how do we use 
various building blocks to actually come up with ways of, of developing these knowledge experts. And instead of going through and talking about all of these, I want to give you three examples that then lead up to something that I hope will uh, uh, th thread through to what, uh, what uh, Matt was talking about. The first has to do with optimizing the access to data and insights. I think that those who will actually solve problems are those who learn how to maximize the flow of relevant data. It's actually not going to be about those who generate the data. It's how can we, as a principle, figure out how to maximize the flow of, of relevant data. We've been thinking of how you could build tools, and one of them is this tool called Synapse, that allows complete transparency, reproducibility, so that you actually don't necessarily have to go back and repeat that experiment, or actually you could go back and repeat the experiment or look at what someone did. And how could you make it so that actually someone wanted another person to solve the problem? One of the big puzzles I have is when someone comes up with a great idea or they have something they think is important, instead of going, hey, can anyone else in the world help me solve it? The general tendency, don't tell anyone. I want this for myself, okay? That's really absurd. We have to get to a culture where if someone has a nice idea, they want to go, is there anyone out there that can help me, instead of assuming they can do that by themselves. So in the software industry, again, the other half of the room will know that GitHub has become a powerful, overnight, brilliant, million plus person, uh, basically standard for working when you have to build very large uh, sets of, of code. Biologists are still stuck with the, um, inability to share information until there's some sort of a credit given in terms of publishing article. So what we basically said is, if we're going to accelerate research, we must have a way where people can get their credit, they can get a way to, to feel as if they're getting acknowledged, um, to get jobs off of what they're doing, not what people say they're doing. And so Synapse basically functions as a GitHub for biomedical data. Um, at the heart of it, is provenance. Provenance allows people to say, I took this, I did this to it, you can go find out what I did. Um, if you like that, go borrow that, fork it, just like you do with code. So Synapse has begun to be used, and yesterday I was at the National Institute of Aging, where uh, fortunately Synapse is threading together something in the order of 15 different universities from Florida to the Mayo to uh, the Broad, et cetera. And all these researchers in all those places are taking their data in real time and taking, whether it's in human or mouse, Drosophila data, whether it's modifications that they're doing in those systems and generating the data. And all of that is being made available in real time to everyone who's working in that system. And then what was really hard on their universities, not on the scientists, but on the universities was that we're releasing all that data into the public domain well before publication on quarterly basis is saying, if you can't claim it up in a quarter, that's too bad. And so February 16th, with backing from the White House, this data is starting to flow out. Not genomic data, people are used to that. This is data on real experiments, on compounds, sharing it in, in real time. And right now, we have over 20 different communities that are actually um, working in this way from uh, some that are working on iPS stem cells and sharing their data and making it so the, the cell lines are annotated in ways that other people can use to type 2 diabetes to, to other things. And so one thing to do is to make it so that a community is stitched together with the technology, um, with the support that makes it something that they are comfortable with sharing their data like that. The second has to do with positive outliers, you would say. Um, we were interested in uh, something that seemed puzzling, which is 95% of the dollars spent on the research in diseases and coming up with therapies is spent on looking at those who are sick. If you were from Mars and you were to look at how am I going to find a way to prevent diseases, wouldn't you look at those who don't get them? And it, and it just, I mean, logically, but 95, 98% of the money goes the other direction. So we said, what could we learn by just looking at people who are normal? And so what we realized was if we picked mutations that were occurring in genes that coded diseases that occurred during childhood, that by the time you were 30 or 40, you were a positive outlier just to be among us, just to be alive. 
And so we realized this was a nice opportunity to take hundreds of childhood diseases, find those uh, particular alleles that were highly penetrant, and, and, and uh, start looking in normal people. Now the lucky thing that happened on data sharing was we went to a number of groups that actually had very large repositories of data. Some of them were in the UK. Um, there's a company uh, close to here, 23andMe, 300,000 uh, samples. We went to BGI in China, and we st asked them, would they let us go through their data, find out whether anyone was actually sitting there with these mutations that they had not noticed, and found all of a sudden zoomed up to 590 some thousand individuals. It ended up being, the, has been the largest genetic study anyone has ever done without ever touching anything, just using resources that were out there because people were willing to share. So a very large set of 590 some thousand subjects turned into 50,000 candidates, or sorry, 10,000 candidates that turned into about 50 potential candidates. In the end, we ended up getting roughly a handful, a couple of handfuls of unexpected hero candidates in genes, though, that we knew a lot about, cystic fibrosis, Pfeiffer syndrome, et cetera. And it told us that this was an important way to proceed. And as we did that in the last year, um, we've begun to have extended families, people coming to us and saying, um, hey, there's this one person, all of these people have the same mutation, but there's this one person who actually is a positive outlier. So while we've been going off looking at now over a million individuals and getting individuals that way, um, we have examples such as this. This is someone who is in their 60s, but they have a presenilin mutation, which is a, 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 a particular alteration that ends up giving those individuals Alzheimer's in their 40s in a, such a severe way that seven brothers and three cousins of this individual all died in their 40s, and he's 62. Something he has is different from his other. So with Randy Bateman and Allison Goat, there was an article in the New York Times at the end of last year on this. Um, Doug Whitney is helping us and his family go through and figure out what's behind it. What's the second fun part of this is to do this, what we've done is we've asked anyone in the world who's interested, would you like to work on these samples? And what we've found is when you get to something that's this unique, anyone without funding is glad to join. So the Broad, the Sanger, all these places have come in and said, we'll help you do IPS cells and do CRISPR knockouts into the IPS cells. This group's doing Drosophila. This group is doing animal modeling. and so. We think that you can build a federation of people. If you have an interesting problem, you can build a federated problem without getting a bunch of money out there that allows people to come together to work on these positive outliers. The third example um, has to do with how do you get people who are outside the quote unquote set of experts? How do you get some incentives and rewards that allow people to come in? And so we've been uh, trying out challenges. I'm a little embarrassed to talk about challenges in this room as I think many people know DARPA probably knows more about challenges and has learned more than anyone else. So as neophytes, what we wanted to do was to see if we could get collaborative challenges. So not the top coder incentive, uh, Kaggle type where they're mercenary, we said, can we build communities where people will work with each other to solve it in a, in a collaborative way? And so we did a, a challenge around breast cancer where we got Google to give us free compute space to everyone who wanted to work on the project. We went to science and we said, can we blow up peer review? Can we make it so that the person who wins that challenge gets an automatic paper in science? And that was an incentive, okay? That's the incentive we needed. So with that incentive, with that, um, we ended up having hundreds of groups, uh, thousands of models come through. But why am I telling you this story? Who won this challenge was not some breast cancer biologist. Dimitri was uh, someone who got a patent for doing uh, MPEG data compaction. And in his uh, group was an electrical engineer from China, Wei Yi Cheng. That group took a, pro a solution in physics, brought it into the biology, and blew out everyone else. No one could come close. So electrical engineer who knew nothing about breast cancer, that's who we're looking for. We're hoping that someone in this audience who doesn't think they know anything about infections 
but actually knows something about something else, can come in, can, can blow others away because they actually know how to solve complex problems. We have lots of other challenges that are going on. You can look at them, but what's really important is they bec are becoming continuous challenges where now we don't ask uh, whether there's a definitive solution, but can we use challenges to accelerate the adoption of standards so the person who can beat everyone else is the one who's actually being uh, um, in place until someone knocks them off. Which then um, takes me to um, what we've been thinking about um, the last couple of months. So if we're gonna look at decoding resilience in infectious disease, I think we're gonna need a knowledge network. I don't think it's just gonna be funding goes here. I think we're gonna to have to come up with a way of using these building blocks to uh, come up with a way of finding that information. The idea of studying the healthy to understand mechanisms of resilience had a little sideline that some of you will know, CCR5, was probably the best example of looking for a positive outlier before the oncologists. CCR5, healthy adults here in San Francisco found. There are other examples, but there is no reason why we cannot find some of the mechanisms of resilience. It was first done there. So how to figure out who remains asymptomatic following pathogen exposure, who's able to recover, um, just one really nice example, if you look this week, um, four days ago there was an article in the paper about someone who had horrible, um, grotesque and uh, disfiguring warts and ended up having during their life a mutation, you can talk about positive outliers, and it actually changed their disease and it ended up that there was a mutation that occurred in them that while one part of their life they had the disease, a singular mutation cured the disease. Think of that in terms of the types of things that we're, we're looking for. And so on the last slide, I think um, the only way we're gonna solve some of these really hard problems is not to say this group is funded, but actually to build a network where the people who are the smartest are incented to actually work with people they don't know at all, to have insights that they get credit for in a way that's totally atypical. I mean, if you talk to Keith Yamamoto, those who've studied in academia, our systems are futile. They have not been set up in ways where people get rewarded in this way. And fortunately, I uh, feel as if I can uh, point uh, Keith out because there are occasionally people, such as UCSF, who are thinking about how could we do it in a different way? How can we set up those incentives? Finding those organizations, how can we figure out a way to learn from each other? Thanks very much.